Um, yeah, so Dr. Rondo, you're welcome on stage. Um, so he's a Dutch neuroscientist and neuroengineer and co-founder of carboncopies.org. And um, he also founded the term of full brain, brain emulation. <coughs> Thank you. Hi. <laughs> like another speaker said, I haven't done anything yet, so <laughs> don't cheer just yet. And yeah, I'm actually really glad that that term took off. So when that first came around and we had to come up with a term that was um, a bit more scientifically explanatory than mind uploading, and that really talked about the method a bit, and we were throwing some ideas around back in 2000, um, that's when we came up with whole brain emulation. Um, and yes, that was a term I happened to invent, so I guess I could take the credit for that. But um, uh, I, I see some hands up there. Is there? Sorry? Hold the mic even closer to my mouth. All right. <laughs> this is this is like a, it's going to be germs and stuff. But okay. Um, <laughs> but, but since then, I've been very glad to see that scientists. Uh, across many disciplines in neuroscience have started using that term. They Sometimes they just say brain emulation instead of whole brain emulation. That's fine. At least they're using that terminology so that, you know, we're getting into that field and we understand what it means and that's useful. It's great. Anyways, some things have happened recently. And so my talk is quite different than the talks that I would normally give. Uh, because the organization, uh, Carbon Copies, the nonprofit organization, has started working much more on the research side of things now. Let's see. I have to remind myself what's on the slides right now. So first of all, I'm going to make a few assumptions. I'm going to assume that most of you have heard of mind uploading, so I'm not going to explain what that is, and that you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and that that you have an understanding of what whole brain emulation means in the sense that there is, you know, you attempt to create a reconstruction of the brain as a way to achieve mind uploading. So I'm not going to get into the detail there as either. Um, and that you also have some notion of why you would want to do this sort of thing, so that it can be a, a way to understand ourselves better, to understand intelligence better, maybe guide the development of intelligence in ways that current AI doesn't yet do. Um, also as a means of backup or extending our minds and, and many other things like that. Of course, greater lifespans as well. So plenty of good reasons. Not going to get into that too much either. All right, let's talk a little bit about the state of the art because the important thing here is what has happened in neuroscience in the last few years. Um, the developments in AI have a little bit to do with that, but not as much as you might think. They will in the future though. But before I do so, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of the main sort of uh, mental model of how you would carry out whole brain emulation so that we, we can talk about the areas that have made big strides of progress recently and then look at the ones that are the problems. So this is a, yeah, it's a bit complicated, this slide, so I'm just going to take you through it. Um, this version here is for what we might call scan and copy. So you work with a brain that has been preserved or that has been prepared at least as a sample and that you're going to use some way to obtain data from that and then build a model based on that. So this one uses a lot of information about the structure of a specific sample and it uses a lot of background knowledge about how the function of various components in the brain work and basically something about the blueprint of the brain, but it doesn't use a lot of uh, functional data about an individual <coughs> sample. So it's not doing a lot of functional recording in a human. Instead, you have a patient who has died, you've obtained their brain after their death, and uh, maybe, maybe they, you know, they went through the procedures that have been discussed before here, and, uh, and then you start to obtain the data. So you obtain this here is basically prior knowledge. We know something about the constraints in the brain. We know that the brain uses a certain way to set up its, uh, its neural code, how areas of the brain communicate with one another, and therefore what sort of signals are possible or aren't possible, and so forth. We use that kind of information. Then you may have some validation data that is functional, like you may have done an MRI or something of that with a patient beforehand, but not very much. Then you have to preserve or at least prepare the sample. You preserve it if you need to store it for 100 years, 
You can just do sample prep if you're going to use it right away. Then you obtain connectome data, or let's say morphological data at nanoscale. The word connectome has become a bit diluted recently, so it's a bit complicated to just use that term. So this could be, for example, uh, using electron microscopy or expansion microscopy, various kinds of microscopy to get that kind of data. Then you apply some methods to convert that data into a model that you could run in a computer or run on a chip or run some kind of implementation. You have to validate what you just did. You have to figure out whether what you built is actually correct. And then I guess that's where you get to whole brain emulation, uploads, and all sorts of other wonderful, beautiful things. Okay, so these colors are indicating kind of where I see the really good areas, things that have progressed wonderfully, and parts that are still somewhat problematic, where there's knowledge missing, and then the parts that are really hard. And you can imagine that green, of course, is the color for the areas that have gone really well. So sample prep and obtaining high resolution data over a large scale in the brain going very well. This understanding of the constraints in the brain is still a little iffy. You need some more basic knowledge there. Functional data that you could use for validation, the functional data acquisition methods are not very good at high resolution. This one here is the really hard one. Converting the data that you obtain from the brain into a model that can run in a computer because everything that we obtain, the data we collect, none of it directly corresponds to a parameter in a model. So that's a problem. Validation, knowing whether you built the right model or where your bugs might be, that's a problem. And this is the main part that my talk is about. Okay, so this is a little bit of the nice stuff here. Uh, we finally have these, I'm calling them large scope, not large scale, data sets with nanoscale morphology. So you can have uh, data sets that in the case of Drosophila, shown up top there, uh, may cover the entire brain. Or in the case of mouse, where we now have multiple cubic millimeter data sets. So from multiple mice, there has been a cubic millimeter of the brain that has been scanned, that has been then traced and made available like this. We have these data sets where, unlike in previous studies of the brain, you don't just see little pieces of circuit, but instead you see entire neural circuits, including the long-range connections that go to other parts of the brain. So you can really try to derive what's going on in that system. And you can identify various things too, just by looking at them. I mean, you can see here that there are some clear pyramidal cells in there. So there's a lot of information in these data sets. The data sets are usually taken at a resolution where you have maybe four by four nanometers on a side or eight by eight nanometers on a side. That's small enough so that you can see in multiple pixels resolution, the spines of synapses. You can even, when you look very carefully, you can see the little vesicles that contain neurotransmitter. And if you count them, you can get some idea of maybe how strong the synapse is. Of course, there are also some problems with those data sets, like sometimes there's bad contrast or there are folds or there's noise or something else. But anyway, it's a pretty good data set. All right. Now, typically, what we can do so far is you collect this data, for example, from an electron microscope. You stitch it in two dimensions so that you put all these little pieces you've imaged together into a much larger set. You build a three-dimensional alignment so that you get a stack that you can go through. And then you use, uh, hopefully, an automated and not human method for tracing. Like, for example, the work at the uh, chain group at Google that created this flood filling procedure for uh, building out the three-dimensional objects that you've actually found with this microscopy method. So what you're doing here is we're going from the raw data that came out of the electron microscope to three-dimensional objects of some kind. But they're still just three-dimensional objects. They're just images in 3D. So here we come to the problem part. And well, here's a little quote from the future. Our kids are going to ask, wait a second. Look at this data. You had this for an entire Drosophila. There's a case to be made. It's quite possible 
that these data sets already contained everything you needed to create a working whole brain emulation of a Drosophila. Why didn't you just do it? Well, the reason why we didn't do it is because of this problem, of course. We're still really in the infancy of understanding how you will look at a three-dimensional image like this containing some objects that you've recognized and how you go from that to sets of interconnected equations. You need the equations if you're going to build models that run, if you want to be able to simulate something, if you want to be able to put activity through that system, if you don't just want to look at a picture. So the goal, of course, here is to get to that reconstruction of a working neural circuit and a working neural brain, reproduce cognitive behavior, and then ideally, if you get all the way to having a whole brain, then you could even test whether the behavior of the animal makes sense. You could look at the external behavior at that point. So here's our primary challenge, it's this translation. We're calling this the translation problem because it's a translation from the data you've collected to the parameters that you want in your model. There are really two parts to it. There's system identification that's more about identifying the structure of your problem, it's of your architecture of the models, and then the translation of the data to parameters. So we're trying to get from 3D objects to these sets of interacting equations. Now there are lots of different ways you could start doing that. Um, and what uh, neuroscience typically has been doing, computational neuroscience included, hasn't really been to work with data sets such as we now have to do reconstruction. Instead, what computational neuroscience mostly does and has been doing is that computational models are used as a way to test hypotheses. So you, you state a hypothesis about how some part of the brain works, then you build a model to make a prediction, and then you test whether or not that prediction holds. And you do that lots and lots of times. And very often it's a correlational hypothesis. It's something like, if I give this input down here, or do this behavior with this animal down here, and I record this neuron up here with an electrode or MRI or whatever, is it going to fire? When does it fire? That sort of thing. And of course, there are tons of neurons that are going to fire. That's why these Jennifer Aniston cells are so prevalent. You know, I don't know if you've heard of those, but apparently there are neurons in your brain that will recognize Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> Anyways. I have them. <laughs> or grandmother cells, if you want. <laughs> to recognize your grandmother. Um, okay, so the, there was a somewhat controversial paper, but I think it's a good paper that Jonas and Cording published in 2017, which really talks about this problem in neuroscience. That if you were to take the approach that is typically done in neuroscience, and let's say you had a microprocessor that you didn't know, and maybe you don't even really understand how transistors work, or you only know a little bit about how transistors work, and then you do what, what we're trying to do right now. I mean, maybe you can look at it a little bit, you can do some activity recording and test something somewhere, are you going to find out by doing this, by doing this lots and lots of times, are you going to find out how that microprocessor works? Not with the methods that neuroscience has been using so far. And um, going to the, uh, the annual meeting in Washington last year, um, it was clear that when you looked at the poster floor, thousands of posters, most of them were still basically using the same methods. But there was a sense of some change. There was a small group of scientists that all came together to this meeting about aspirational neuroscience, about how to extract a meaningful and non-trivial memory from a connectome, who really were starting to talk about how do you reverse engineer these circuits from the data that we've collected. And you can tell just from where that conversation is going that there's a paradigm change on the way in neuroscience. There's going to be this moment where neuroscience isn't going to be about doing these correlational tests anymore, Instead, it's going to be causational work, where you're trying to derive a circuit, and then if you say, well, if I activate over here with this pattern, what does this do? You're not going to test one neuron and see if there's a, a correlated activity. Instead, you're going to be able to derive, then these neurons activate like so, and we have a pattern over here, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. It's very different. But there are going to be a lot of methods to try to convert from the data that we've obtained, say, with these electron microscopes, two models. One very typical one is that you might build a compartmental model that is similar to the, looks a bit like that neuron, so all the branches, each one receives a little compartment, 
And what's going on in each of those compartments is related to, you can say there's an analogous electrical circuit, something that has a certain capacitance and a certain resistance, and then you use Hodgkin-Huxley <coughs> equations in each of the compartments and so forth. So you're trying to define, based on ion channels and based on these basic parameters, what's happening in those systems. Or you could even skip that entirely and try to make some predictions based on a very simple model, like say the Shu et al. paper last year did that. They just took the connectome of Drosophila. For every principal cell, they used one model of a principal cell. No real differences between them. No specific tuning of the parameters and all that. For every interneuron, they used one interneuronal model. And then they made some predictions about, okay, if we have activity over here, causing spon spontaneous activity in that region, then which neurons downstream are going to be involved? And then see, do those predictions match what someone has measured before, just to see if that method worked? And, you know, they got some positive results out of that. But that's a far cry from having a real reconstruction of circuits in that brain. So what we have here is a validation problem. In machine learning, it's very typical that if you build something that is, has a certain purpose, has a certain objective, you train it with a data set, and after that, you carry out validation and verification. So you need to have a way of testing whether the thing is actually doing what you're saying it's doing. And right now, with things like the Shu et al. model, you can't do that. You can't make the claim to say, I've reconstructed Drosophila brain, because there's just not enough information there. There's not a way to test that, and a way to validate that. There are some things that have been tried. So for example, in the uh, neuroprosthetic model for hippocampus that people at UCL have been working at, uh, UCA, I'm sorry, UCS <laughs> have been working at, um, they, uh, they came up with some ways to at least functionally try to test whether or not their models are producing output that represents what is expected. Even though neurons don't always fire in the way you want them to, there's a lot of randomness in that. Instead, they looked at an envelope around the membrane potential, how that changed, and that's what they were matching with to see, does our model produce what we'd like to see? And they could do that because they were doing electrode recording, so they had functional data to compare with. That was work by Professor Dong Song, who is a very good supporter of ours in the whole brain emulation circles, so he's someone we're going to hear more about. But how do you do this going from structure to function when you don't have functional data? because all of the brains that we have are unknown. It doesn't matter whether you're working with Drosophila, the fruit fly, or with mouse, or C. elegans even. C. elegans we know more about, but not, not as much as we'd have to to be able to say this is a fully known ground truth network or system. We just don't have those. So how do you find out if your reconstruction is right or wrong, or how right or how wrong it is? How do you know if there are mistakes in it, and how do you find where those mistakes are? And there are lots of different kinds of mistakes you can make. So some of them may show up at the behavioral level. If you have, say, a model of a mouse in a uh, maze, it's been trained on a maze. You built this mouse brain based on the data you had. But it turns out, OK, it's not showing the behavior you expect. In fact, it's not showing any behavior at all. When you press run, it just doesn't work. That's why there's a dead mouse there. Um, yeah. Where was the bug? Why isn't it working? You've got gazillions of pieces of code in there. You don't know why. Uh, so that's the non-op case. But there could also be hidden errors. It could seem like there's something there that works. Like, let's say you built a model, and it shows theta waves and gamma waves and all that kind of rhythmic activity. Looks like a brain. But it's not doing the right things. Or it may seem to be doing the right things for a while, but hours later, when you're not doing your experiment anymore, bugs start showing up. You don't know why. So here's the solution. Well, here's a solution or a method that we're trying to try. In AI, one way that methods have been improved is that there were standardized challenges, such as ImageNet. You have a whole bunch of different pictures of objects that a network is supposed to be able to recognize. You also have them at different difficulty levels, like you might have just simple bicycles or bicycles occluded by something, all kinds of different levels of difficulty. So these are well understood data sets 
that, uh, that are used to compare the performance of different machine learning, vision learning, vision uh, networks. And, and that's how you make progress, or that's one way to make progress, or at least to show how much progress you're making. Now, we need something like that in neuroscience as well. We need to have well understood data sets. They're tuned to the requirements that we have, so they're tuned to certain success criteria for brain emulation. And through those, because they're the same and they are understood, we're going to get rapid improvement because we have rapid feedback that is fair and very concrete. Now, because we can't use uh, any of the brains that we don't know anything about, we have to make our own. To make this serialized, standardized whole brain emulation challenge, we have to come up with a different way of doing that. Um, so I'll get into that now. Let's see how we do this. Can't use fruit flies, can't use mice, can't use C. elegans, but there are some things we can use. We can create systems in silico. This here is just an example from Bluebrain, but we're, I'll show you some more of ours later. We can make our own in silico, and there is a whole discussion to be had about there. What do you put in, what do you not put in, how detailed do you make them? Get into that in a moment. Or you can do them in vitro. In vitro, cell cultures, you have the advantage you can, for example, stick it on an electrode or on electrodes and a grid of electrodes. So you have a lot of access to them. You can stimulate and record. You can see them under a microscope. If you make the, uh, the culture simple enough, you don't have too many neurons in there, this one's probably a little too uh, complex, then you can make it basically fully knowable. In silico, of course, it can be fully knowable because you have access to all the code. So you know exactly what the structure of your network is and you know exactly what activity is going on in there. All right, so what would this look like? If we have a standardized challenge that's based on these in silico and in vitro methods. A candidate, like say a lab, let's say Conrad Cording or someone else, comes along, they have some methods in mind that they want to use to reconstruct from, say, electron microscope images or something like that. So they say the data we need are images from an electron microscope, or they might say, we want to co-register all of our electron microscope images with calcium imaging to be able to see some kind of functional data. Okay, so those are their requirements. Then our team has to make sure that we have the physics, or at least the virtual physics in place, to provide data that is like that. So that they'll say, okay, we're satisfied now that we can take this challenge. There are the ground truth systems in silico or in vitro. From that, you get sets of acquired brain data. That is what you give back to the candidate. You don't give them the ground truth networks course, because, you know, they could cheat, they could just look at them. They apply their reconstruction methods and give it back to us, and then we compare what they've done and the performance of their system with the original, with the ground truth systems, using criteria and validation metrics that we've developed. So they get a score and they get detailed feedback about things like, this is where you made errors, these are the functions that were supposed to be in the system. You found 80% of them, here are the 20% you didn't find. Oh, and you confabulated 10 others that weren't in there. So anyways, they'll get some feedback. And this, of course, is based on setting up some validation metrics. And the validation metrics are based on success, success criteria that we have that aim at the objectives of brain emulation. To come up with these objectives, what we did is we carried on a certain events. We had uh, three different events where we asked participants to come up with all the things that they thought were important for a working brain emulation. And it ended up having, there were several categories of them. There were psychological ones, like drives, behaviors, personality traits, cognitive ones, like capabilities, awareness, problem solving, memory neuronal ones like the components themselves and similarities in their function, thank you, embodiment, and so forth. So we collected all of that and ended up working towards getting validation metrics. We found a subset of eight of them that we can apply to these small neural circuits so we can use them with our examples, the things that we're using as ground truth networks, not whole brains, because some of the stuff about embodiment and whatnot didn't really play a role here. 
Okay, that's just an example of uh, doing some simulated uh, EM through a stack of simulated cells. It's not really important right now. More important as we're getting to the end of this talk is just to look at how this would be set up not as a single challenge, but as a series of challenges. Just like in AI, it would start with trying to get networks to just recognize this is a bicycle and not a car. After that, you can do rotations and get it to recognize that as well, make the data set more difficult. Then you can deal with occlusions and all the sort of stuff that Tesla cars still have trouble with. In our case, you can start with very simple networks, like the same way that you wouldn't teach a student to try to understand how to calculate orbits by working with really complicated bodies. You would start with basically spherical objects in a vacuum, right? The proverbial spherical chicken in a vacuum that physicists love to work with. So here, for instance, you could use ball and stick neurons where the soma is just a ball, axon is just a cylinder, so that it's easy to recognize, have not too many of them, a simple type of spiking. First level of challenge, let's see if your method, the method that you propose to use in a really complicated soup, is going to work on that. If it works on that, let's try something more complicated. Add dendritic branches and perhaps dendritic computations that you need to pull out of that. Thousands of neurons. Use multiple types of neurons. Maybe add glial cells to make the interstitial spaces messier. After that, you can ask for things like, we're going to work with systems that have recurrence in them and you need to pull the function out of that. It turns out to be pretty hard. Or you also have to give us back the plasticity of the system, that it evolves in a similar way. And then you start to go towards real-world conditions. So over time, these things that you do in silico become difficult and then eventually become very similar to what the in vitro system would be like, how difficult that would be. Once you've got methods that work fairly well on this, then you have a very good case for taking those into slices like retina or something like that, tiny animals. We had some conversations with uh, scientists who were trying to work on the cutting edge there, who, for example, are already trying C. elegans and trying to use methods on those that they would then want to apply to Drosophila, mouse, etc., like Conrad Cording, and he was quite happy when we had this conversation about this challenge here. So we got this beautiful tweet from him here where he's directly talking about whole brain emulation. I really like the whole brain emulation folks, despite having very different long-term goals. One, they believe we can understand, simulate brains. Two, they care about actually succeeding at it. And three, they care about high levels of scientific rigor. Optimism is great. So that was nice. Yeah, I don't really have to get into this. This is more for the people who want to help out, who maybe want to learn to work with our stuff because it's all on GitLab. And uh, we have a front end where we want things to be easy for neuroscientists to use so they can tip, really play with the system and play with the validation metrics. That talks through an API to a server on the back end that is optimized for using multiple CPUs on multiple systems and GPUs to try to get the performance cranked up for these harder problems. Here's our plan. Um, we're basically in this area here. We're trying to get to the demo stage because once we have a demo, we're giving it to Conrad Cording. He's going to give us some feedback and review so that we can tweak our system and make it work better. And then we're going to announce the challenge. Once we have the challenge out there, we probably have to spin out the team that does the challenge, that keep on maintaining it and working with people to do the right data because we're going to want to participate ourselves. We have our own ideas about how to do emulation, so we want to do the challenge ourselves. And eventually you get up to human. And this is the last slide. This is just an invitation for everyone here who might be interested in this to contact us, to join us. As I said, it's open source, so you can look at it right there, but of course it's easier to just work with us. Uh, of course you can branch it if you want to, but you can just work with us too. Just, you know, shoot me a, an email or something, and uh, I'd be happy to talk about more. Thank you.